Welcome to Sophie and Co. I'm Sophie Shevardnadze. Our topic today is tasty but possibly dangerous. Genetically modified products are invading our supermarkets. Looking good, tasting fine, growing quick in the field. They look like an awesome way to solve food supply issues. But what if the real cost of these beauties is revealed when it's already too late? The God Delusion, breaking into nature's design. The green revolution and genetic engineering tech were sold as the keys to feed the world's hungry. But famines still strike. The world's most vulnerable have not been saved. In the developed world, corporate lobbying and sleight of hand blind consumers to reality, for which a compliant corporate media carries ads, but few expose. Is GMO just misrepresented? Is it just misunderstood? Or a devil in angel's disguise? One name resonates where GMO is at stake, Monsanto. The agrochemical giant that brought you Agent Orange. Can they be trusted? Are they too big to fail? Who's in their pocket? And what's in the packet? And our guest today is Jeffrey Smith from the Institute for Responsible Technology, author of books on health dangers from genetically modified organisms. Jeffrey, great to have you with us today. Great to be here. All right. so. If you were explaining to a school kid in plain words, how would you explain what's wrong with a genetically modified product? Well, with genetically modified products, you take individual genes from the DNA of one species and you force it into the DNA of other species. So you can mix, mix and match between humans, animals, viruses, bacteria, and plants. Now, this is completely new. This was never done before. It's a radical new way of creating organisms that are not the products of the billions of years of evolution and not the products of sexual reproduction. What you need to know is that the process itself is flawed. It creates unpredicted side effects. So there can be new allergens, new toxins, new anti-nutrients, carcinogens created from the process itself. Then there's what they put in and it turns out they're putting toxins into our food that kill insects. And they're also putting other things in the, in the plants that allow the plants to be drenched with more toxins, weed killers, which we consume. So whether it's the process of genetic engineering itself or the specific gene that they put in, there's now considerable evidence that this is not something you want to put in your mouth. Mm -hmm. Now, we know there has been a lot of research on pigs, on rats. Have there been any proven cases of GMO-provoked diseases in humans? Well, we know in the 1980s there was a food supplement called L-tryptophan. But one company that produced the L-tryptophan from Japan genetically engineered bacteria to produce it more economically. And that process of genetic engineering almost certainly introduced contaminants into the tryptophan, which killed about 100 Americans and caused 5 to 10,000 to fall sick. Tragically, the FDA completely covered up the links to genetic engineering, did not even report on the fact that it was a genetically engineered brand that caused the problem when they reported on the epidemic to Congress and hid the evidence from investigators. Mm -hmm. This has been typical of the FDA's stance at promoting genetically modified foods. Now, we, do, we don't have any human feeding studies to look at, but we do now have case studies. Thousands of physicians around the United States are prescribing non-GMO diets to their patients. They and the patients tell us that they're getting better from a wide variety of diseases and disorders. And so this gives us support for what we're also seeing with lab animals, with livestock, and with the theoretical characteristics of the toxins that are in the foods that we eat. Can I ask you something? Do you disagree with the use of GMOs on purely scientific medical grounds, or do you also have moral qualms as well? I have no problem with the technology per se. I think it's important to have the technology. If we can correct a defective gene in a human being with human gene therapy, that's great. But that's a risk that one person will take. Right now, we cannot predictably and safely manipulate the genes in the way that we're doing to protect health and the environment. So to, so to release the products of this infant science, which is prone to side effects, into the food supply, 
and moreover into the environment where the self-propagating pollution of the gene pool through pollen drift and seed movement makes it irreversible, that's not responsible at this time. Maybe in 50 to 100 years, maybe at some point in the future when we fully understand the DNA enough to make these manipulations, then it would be responsible to introduce GMOs into the outdoors or food. I know that advocates of the GM crop say they can help us combat poverty, starvation, diseases in the developing world. Is there any truth in these claims? Well, not according to the experts, just according to the public relations groups of the biotech industry. The world's experts at feeding the world and eradicating poverty actually have a report called the ISTAD report, sponsored by the UN and the World Health Organization, etc. And it concludes that GMOs in their current form have nothing to offer feeding the world or eradicating poverty. But this has been the promise to get people to try and promote the technology and accept the technology, but it doesn't bear out. In fact, it doesn't even increase average yield. It reduces yield on average according to independent science. But Jeffrey, from your point of view, are there any tangible benefits at all from GMOs? If you put blinders on, yes. You see, the most popular genetically modified crop is called Roundup Ready. It's produced by Monsanto, and they produce Roundup herbicides. So the Roundup Ready crops are able to drink or withstand applications of Roundup herbicide, which would normally kill the plant. So from the narrow farmer's perspective of weeding, it's easier, because you can spray over the top of the crops, kill all the other plant biodiversity, but not the Roundup Ready crops. What they don't look at is the health dangers to those who eat the crops that now have the Roundup absorbed into the food portion. They don't look at the damage to the soil, the damage to the ecosystem, the promotion of plant diseases, more than 40 of them in the United States as a result of the use of Roundup. If you look at the big picture, the current generation fails. If you narrow yourself down to one particular attribute, you can sing the praises of this flawed technology. Right, so Monsanto produces Roundup, right? Uh Tell me, show me the bigger picture. How did Monsanto get so big? Monsanto is the largest seed company in the world. Now, their background is quite controversial. They've been continually voted the most hated and most unethical company on Earth for years and years with stiff competition. They lied about the toxicity of their former products, PCBs, Agent Orange, DDT, and they have an unprecedented control around the world in the regulatory bodies. This is exemplified by the Food and Drug Administration, where the policy on GMOs was overseen by Monsanto's former attorney, Michael Taylor. And the policy falsely claims that the agency wasn't aware of any information showing that GMOs were significantly different. Therefore, the FDA requires no safety studies and no labeling. They leave it up to Monsanto to determine if their foods are safe, and Monsanto doesn't even have to tell the FDA or consumers if it wants to slip a GMO into our food supply. Now, Michael Taylor, after overseeing this policy, he became Monsanto's vice president and chief lobbyist. Now he's back at the FDA as the U.S. food safety czar. But documents made public from a lawsuit revealed that the overwhelming consensus among the scientists working at the FDA was exactly the opposite of that exposed in the policy. The scientists said GMOs would be dangerous, could create allergies, toxins, and new diseases, and should be tested. Now, Monsanto's takeover, essentially, of the FDA has been replicated around the world. I've been to 37 countries, and I've seen how they capture regulators, ministries, departments, etc. And once that happens, they discredit and dismiss any adverse findings about GMOs. They don't even read the dossier. Unfortunately, it's a rubber stamp situation around the world, and if you trace it back, it comes down to they're doing it based on Monsanto's own research, which we've caught them red-handed, rigging their research to avoid finding problems and covering up problems when they, when they persist nonetheless. But I still don't understand how Monsanto got so big. The, they have paid an enormous amount of money 
for campaign contributions and lobbying. Uh, the recent uh, a recent article came out. They spent 8.7 million dollars last year. They have a very strategic way of infiltrating influence. In fact, the entire biotech industry and big ag does. A former FDA official said that. Big Ag, basically the regulatory agencies, FDA, EPA, and USDA, have done everything that Big Ag has asked them to do and told them to do. So we, have, we see influence even in the courts. Uh, Clarence Thomas on the Supreme Court was Monsanto's former attorney. The uh, Secretary of Agriculture, Tom Vilsack, was the former biotech governor of the year. He had given an award to Monsanto. The chief negotiator for the United States is a former crop life uh, person, basically the trade group for Monsanto and the other biotech groups. The person at the USDA who used to give out money for research, another Monsanto person. When they approved bovine growth hormone, Monsanto's drug, which is injected into cows to increase milk supply, two former researchers from Monsanto took positions at the FDA at the time that the drug was approved. So they have insinuated themselves in through money, revolving door, and other influence methods. Jeffrey, are there any countries that officially oppose GMOs? Oh, yes. In fact, there are many countries that do not allow GMOs to be planted on their soil. Many countries in Europe, Peru, Switzerland, uh, Venezuela, there's countries like Zambia that don't allow it in the food supply. But the, by and large, there's about six countries that do most of the growing, maybe 90% of the growing, and they export the food around the world, and so a lot of people are exposed. But in Europe, the big ban in Europe is not from the governments, but it's from the food companies. In February 1999, a gag order was lifted on a scientist, and the scientist was doing research on GMOs to figure out how to test for the safety. He accidentally discovered that GMOs are extremely dangerous, within 10 days caused massive health problems to rats. He went public with his concerns and was a hero for two days at his prestigious institute. But then phone calls from the UK Prime Minister's office to the director ended up causing him to be fired the next day, silenced with threats of a lawsuit. But in February 1999, the gag order was lifted by an order of Parliament, and there was a firestorm of media about the health dangers of GMOs. Within 10 weeks, the tipping point of consumer rejection was achieved in Europe, so Unilever, followed by Nestle, followed by virtually every other food company, committed to not feed Europeans derivatives of GMOs. The same companies feed Americans and Canadians and others the derivatives of GMOs because we haven't raised a stink, because the information about the health dangers has not been widely circulated on those continents. All right, it's time for a short break. Coming up next, is the GM genome reversible and can Monsanto be a force for good? Stay tuned. The media lead us, or we lead the media. Privacy versus security. All right, your party. Uh, where's it going? The questions that no one is asking with the guests that you deserve answers from. It's all on politicking, only on RT.
welcome back to the show. We're talking about genetic engineering and how it bites into our lives with anti-GMO activist and author Jeffrey Smith. Uh, Jeffrey, we're talking about Europe. So the problem there is that the EU requires gym products to be labeled as such. But there is a loophole there where imported products don't need to be labeled. How did that happen? And do you think we'll see more and more gym crops being grown in Europe? Well, to clarify, imported products that contain GMOs in Europe do have to be labeled. But the imported animal feed, once it's fed to the animals, the milk and meat in Europe do not have to be labeled as genetically modified. And that loophole has allowed millions of tons of genetically modified feed to be entering the food supply in Europe. And this has resulted, we believe, in some of the health problems. Now, in the United States, we see a lot of the health problems that are associated with GMOs on the rise here. We see uh, gastrointestinal disorders, immune system problems like allergies and asthma and autoimmune disease, leaky gut, diabetes, inflammatory-based diseases, reproductive disorders like infertility. And we see a lot of these reversing in people and livestock and lab animals when they're switching from GM to non-GM feed. However, in Europe, it's harder to evaluate because people are getting exposed to GMOs as animal feed, and that may influence, it certainly does influence the health of the animals. We've seen damage to virtually every organ and every system in animals, potentially precancerous cell growth, smaller brains, livers, and testicles, inflamed immune system organs, damage to the liver and kidneys, etc. So we don't know the impacts of eating sick animals. And also the animals are nutrient deficient because Roundup binds with nutrients, making them unavailable to plants. The animals' large, their most popular dish is Roundup ready soy, corn, cottonseed, canola meal, sugar beet pulp, and alfalfa. So they're eating nutrient deficient food. There's a universal deficiency among the livestock, certainly in the U.S., among these nutrients. That creates more sickness in the animals. Similarly, the dairy is influenced. You can get DNA from the genetically modified feed. So the European consumers are largely unaware that they're still being exposed to GMOs, which may be negatively influencing their health. Mm -hmm. Jeffrey, but if everything is so dangerous as you say it is, because I guess in America people are much more of aware of what you're saying that people here in Russia or in Europe, why are the sales going up? Why are they growing? Well, actually, the sales of non-GMO labeled products are growing faster than any other category. It was the fastest growing category of food sales in 2012. We have non-gmoshoppingguide.com and a free iPhone application called Shop No GMO with over 10,000 products that are verified as non-GMO. Whole Foods president told USA Today that when a product becomes third-party verified as non-GMO, sales increase by 15 to 30 percent. Hundreds more companies are enrolling, and this is creating the tipping point. We saw the tipping point happen in Europe. We're seeing stage after stage of the tipping point unfolding in the United States. The desire for non-GMO products, because of the concerns about health, especially for children who are most at risk, have driven a movement for labeling. So labeling laws have passed in Connecticut and Maine or is expected to pass in Washington state in the fall. More than two dozen other states have introduced labeling bills as legislation. They have not yet passed, but many are expected to pass next year as well. So we're seeing a movement against GMOs, and we think this will result in their elimination from the food supply by the food companies who will see it as a marketing liability. Well, that's good to hear. That's for sure. That's for one thing. But can I ask you another thing? These companies like Monsanto, for example, who produce these GMOs, they're certainly also aware of all the repercussions and dangers. What do you think are the motives for them? Is there any more to it than just a simple case of corporate greed? Well, I first want to confirm what you said. I spoke to a former Monsanto scientist, and he confirmed what we already knew that when rats were damaged by Monsanto's corn in an industry study, instead of withdrawing the corn, they rewrote the study to hide the evidence. Similarly, he told me that three of Monsanto's safety study testers for bovine growth hormone, which is injected into cows to increase milk supply, they tested the milk and found so much 
IGF-1, a cancer-promoting hormone in the milk, that the three Monsanto scientists refused to drink milk thereafter, one, unless it was organic, one bought his own cow. Now we know from experience that Monsanto has this agenda to push it out. We, I talked to someone who was in a San Francisco conference in 1999, and he heard Monsanto's consultant, Arthur Anderson, describe how he had worked with Monsanto's executives by asking them first, what's your ideal future in 15 to 20 years? The executives described a world in which 100% of all commercial seeds were genetically engineered and patented. And this would give Monsanto and the few biotech industry uh, colleagues control of the world's seed supply. When you control the seeds, you control the food. This, the food is the largest traded commodity. If you have control of the food and control of the farmers, it's an enormous control and profit motive. In addition, they want to introduce terminator technology that makes the seeds sterile. It's not yet commercialized, but it's targeted, if introduced, to the 1.4 billion farmers in the world that save their seed. That doesn't pay Monsanto anything. So they want all the farmers in the world to be going to the catalogs of Monsanto for their genetically modified patented seeds. So this is an effort to replace the products of the billions of years of evolution with designer genes and designer organisms designed for greater profit and control. So the situation is pretty similar to how it was back in the 70s with tobacco, remember? Tobacco, uh, dangers of tobacco were publicly acknowledged, but people were suddenly working for profit even though they knew that it was damaging public health. The tobacco analogy is a good one, but the influence of tobacco will pair in comparison to that which GMOs can and are creating right now. You see, GMOs are in the food supply, so they affect everyone who eats. They're also released outdoors where the genes can outlast the effects of global warming and nuclear waste as a permanent feature in the gene pool. So it becomes an irreversible technology that can influence every human being, all living beings, and all future generations. But similarly to the tobacco industry, they use tobacco science with the biotech industry. They use the wrong detection methods, the wrong controls, the wrong statistics, and when they do find problems, they try to cover it up. This we've shown time and time again, for example, in my book, Genetic Roulette, or the movie by the same name. Mm -hmm. uh, talk to me about the soil. Is the penetration of the GM genome into the agricultural ecosystem reversible or is it too late? We do know from laboratory studies that genes can transfer from the genetically modified crops into the microorganisms in the soil. So that's one way. We also know it can get into the uh, little critters in the soil. We, can, we found genes there. In addition, the Roundup, which is sprayed on tremendous millions of acres. More than half a million pounds more herbicide is used on GMOs in the first 16, half a billion pounds because of the herbicide tolerant crops. This Roundup destroys the beneficial bacteria in the soil which provide nutrients to the plant and it promotes the pathogens in the soil. So there's more than 40 plant diseases on the rise in the U.S. agriculture and the Roundup unlike what Monsanto advertised and got caught for false advertising by courts in the United States and in France, the Roundup can persist in the soil for years, even decades. So this is a huge problem. We haven't solved the problem of remediating it, of fixing it, but then there's the BT toxin. The BT toxin is produced in corn and cotton. It's designed to break little holes in the cell walls of the insect's stomachs to kill them. It's now found to break holes in human cells, possibly causing leaky gut. It gets through the cell walls and somehow gets into the bloodstream. It was found in the blood of 93% of the pregnant women tested, 80% of their unborn fetuses. So now we have a hole-poking toxin in the blood of our fetuses, which gets in their brain because there's no blood-brain barrier developed at that stage. So this is a nightmare. But the BT toxin also binds with clay in the soil and can wash into 
rivers and affect the marine ecosystem, which it does. And so we're sending this toxin out in millions of acres in the ecosystem and possibly even colonizing our own gut bacteria with this gene, turning our gut bacteria into living pesticide factories. We can say this because the only human feeding study conducted on soy found that the gene inserted into soybeans, part of it transferred into the DNA of gut bacteria and may have continued to function. They shut down the experiment as soon as they found that because it was a very scary thing to think that the genetically modified genes may be producing proteins inside our digestive tract long after we stop eating GMOs. They never tested to see if eating a corn chip that produces the Bt toxin, might the gene might transfer to the gut bacteria, turning it into living pesticide factories causing toxic and immune responses inside of us. So whether it's the bacteria in the soil or the bacteria in our gut, this stuff is pervasive. Furthermore, Roundup kills beneficial gut bacteria, and it doesn't kill the nasty stuff like Salmonella, botulism, and E. coli. Now we know that the gut bacteria is extremely important for health, for the digestive tract, for the digest digestive system, for the immune system. When you kill the beneficial gut bacteria, that problem is linked with a whole host of diseases which have been on the rise in the U.S. population since Roundup has been mm -hmm. used in such high quantities. Well, that's really scary. Really scary. I know there were huge anti-Monsanto protests ac across the United States and Canada back in May. Who were the organizers? Who turned out in support of it? Just really shortly because we're out of time. The, the uh, Facebook post came on about a march against Monsanto. They expected a few thousand. They got more than two million protesters in 52 countries. This shows just how concerned and how and how uh, motivated people are around the world to protect their food supply and their agriculture and their environment from Monsanto and GMOs. Thank you so much for this really interesting insight. Hope we get to do this again. And I have plenty of other questions that I didn't have time to ask you. So looking forward for session two. Jeffrey Smith, author and publisher from the Institute of the Responsible Technology, thank you once again for this insight. You're with Sophie Enko and me, Sophie Sheratnadze. I will see you next time.